the stark in memoriam on this old gravestone, scarcely hints at the tragedy which revulsed Adelaide on that long ago Christmas day. Harry Oxley was born in England on the 8th of December 1860. He was one of four brothers and at least one sister from Sheffield in Yorkshire. His father had died when he was young and he was placed in the care of two of his elder brothers. When he was older he was apprenticed to a pawnbroking business but emigrated to Australia while still a young man. He worked at Cairnbank, a station near the town of Narracourt, before being employed at McGarry Station, also near Narracourt. For about twelve years he worked as a boundary rider on the station in the southeast of South Australia. Oxley was described as quiet and thoughtful in nature, and a vigorous looking youth. He had a mass of dark curly hair and stood about five foot eight. It was there that after working a few months he met Emma Holmes, the daughter of a Narracourt baker, who worked on the same station as a domestic servant. Emma was born on the 8th of January 1859. The two married on the 30th of July 1882, and within a few years they had their three little lambs. Harry Walter, born on the 13th of June 1883, Grace, born 28th of October 1884, and Ethel, born on the 23rd of September 1887. The family dwelled in a house on the station fronting the Border Town Road, nine miles from Narracourt, until 1891, when they rented a house in Narracourt to enable the children to attend school. Oxley was considered a model employee and spent most of his free time with his family. He was a zealous churchgoer who, after the move into town, became a Sunday school teacher. As a teetotaler, he was also involved with the Sons of Temperance Lodge and also helped set up a Cadets of Temperance Lodge. Although he seemed to be exemplary in his behaviour, and of a kindly disposition, those who were closest to him had observed a nervous temperament, able to be easily upset if something of importance went awry. It was only recently that Oxley received a legacy from England. From his grandmother and father's estates he inherited a fourth share of a large farm. One of his brothers had also emigrated to Australia, and Harry was found when the other brother William was traced and found to have died in Queensland about 1885, drowned while trying to cross a river near Cairns. About £2,000 was his share of the inheritance. He received £1,400 which he deposited in the National Bank one week before the financial crisis of 1893 caused the bank to close its doors temporarily in April. The amount was credited to him in preference shares and fixed deposits during the reconstruction of the bank and he received £75 interest per annum from this source. He received another £500 in about October 1893, £200 of which he placed in his wife's name in the savings bank. The family had been used to living within their means on Harry's wage, and the extra money did little to change their frugal lifestyle. He apparently wanted to use his money to buy a market garden near Adelaide, and travelled to the capital city to find something suitable. Instead, he ended up purchasing Frederick White's greengrocer's store in Sturt Street. Harry also believed his children would obtain a better education in the city, and had hopes of sending his son to college. On the 8th of December 1893, the Oxley family were farewelled by friends from the Narracourt railway station, leaving to begin a new life in Adelaide. The family stopped with relatives at Mitcham, before moving into their new home on the 18th of December 1893. The shop and house was on the corner of Hobson's Lane, not far from Whitmore Square. The building no longer exists, but was small, with a room extending down the lane, and another room off on the Sturt Street side. A galvanised iron fence seven feet high enclosed a large yard, in which were outbuildings, including a stable for two horses. The gate opened into Hobson's Lane, and a large greengrocer's van was parked in the yard. About 20 feet of vacant land separated the shop from the next building east on Sturt Street. Although his neighbours had little time to form an opinion of the man, he was thought to be jovial and kind-hearted by those who encountered him. Emma was likewise considered a lively and happy person, of a pleasant and kindly disposition. The children were always nicely dressed and well behaved. Almost at once, Harry expressed buyer's remorse. He had purchased the business for £110, including stock, two horses and trolley. 
He even tried to offer Mr. White fifty pounds to get out of the deal, but was refused. He complained to his brother-in-law that he had been swindled. The manager of the shop, William Stanley, who had been employed by White, tried to tell Oxley that the business was a fair one, and urged him to stick with it. Lilias Day worked in the shop for White, and on the 16th of December was introduced to Mr. and Mrs. Oxley, agreeing to continue working for them until the end of the year. She found Oxley to be a devoted father and husband, but by the end of the week he was acting a little peculiar. Emma confided to Elias that Harry was not sleeping well. On Friday, December 22nd, Oxley seemed weighed down by depression and despondency over his position, yet on Saturday he appeared to have rallied and was his normal jovial self. That evening he was at the market, selling produce with Stanley and was joking with the other man. Mrs Jones, who owned a store on the opposite corner from the Oxleys, got to know the family reasonably well during the week. She too noted Harry's depression. Her son took the girls to see the streets and markets, as they had never been in the city at Christmas time before. As the children were leaving, Harry called out to the Jones boy, Mind you look after my pets. Emma's sister, Alice Streeter, and her family from Mitcham visited on Saturday evening, and they noticed Emma was melancholy, and she told them Harry was downhearted. The Streeters went to see Harry at the Central Market, where he had his fruit and veg store, and at first he was despondent, but then apparently cheered up. When Stanley left that night, both Harry and Emma were pleased with the outcome of the day. Not much was seen of the family on December the 24th, but neighbours noticed them walking down the street at about 9pm, chatting happily. Mrs Elizabeth Maley, who was visiting from Narracourt on Sunday, guessed that something was not right. She asked Emma, Harry's ill, isn't he? Emma burst into tears, saying yes, and he has been so for the last few days. Mrs. Maley asked them to cheer up. Later on, Harry admitted, I don't know. I can't tell what's the matter with me. He said there was a great weight on him, which he could not carry, but neither could he shake off. It was very foolish, he said, but he couldn't help it, although he had fought hard against it. He said he had a tight feeling about his waist. Mrs. Maley asked if he could have had sunstroke. Perhaps I have, Harry said but continued to speak of being deceived and being disappointed. Then he said, perhaps after all the trouble was physical only. His wife suggested he see a doctor, and he promised he would. Mrs. Maley left at 10.30, but noticed that every sound startled and frightened Oxley. A party of carol singers led by a neighbour named Ashby had borrowed one of Oxley's horses, and they went all over Adelaide singing until the early hours of the morning. Ashby didn't return the horse until half past four. The big gate was locked, so Ashby kicked on the gate to knock up the inhabitants. Oxley came out in his nightshirt and a pair of pants. He had fallen back into depression and kept Ashby talking for fifteen minutes about his business and asking advice on what he should do. Like the others, Ashby told him to persevere. Oxley remarked that he would give his right hand to be back in Narracourt. The two men said good night and Ashby de departed. What happened next is conjecture. Emma had purchased a new tomahawk on Saturday night from Mrs. Jones, one of the girls collecting it. Almost as soon as Ashby had gone, Oxley entered his home and, taking the tomahawk, approached his ten year old son who was asleep on the couch in the dining room. The first rays of light of Christmas Day were penetrating the room as the back of the axe smashed down on the little boy's head, crushing the right side of his skull with the ferocity of the blow. Blood and brains were strewn about the room, and the pillow saturated. Just ten feet away in the next room, Emma lay sleeping. Harry went to her next, and he struck her on the crown of the head, and then quickly again on the neck, killing her instantly. The two girls were asleep on a bed in the same room. Their father crossed the room and struck first one, knocking her to the floor, and then the other, smashing open their skulls as they slept. Having brained everyone, Oxley may have checked to see if they were dead. His wife may have still been alive, for he may have cut her throat from ear to ear with a razor, in addition to the injuries already inflicted. Dr. Mitchie believed so, although Dr. Robertson thought the throat wound had been made with a tomahawk. 
Robinson also speculated that each victim received two blows from the tomahawk each. Oxley probably returned to his son and found him dead. The tomahawk was found by the sofa. Then he returned to the bedroom. Harry Oxley stood alone in the room, surrounded by the blood and the bodies of his beloved family. Harry took the razor and, standing over the body of his daughter, cut his own throat. He turned and stumbled and fell across the bed where his wife lay. At 7.40am, Stanley arrived to feed the two horses. He busied himself cleaning up the yard, expecting to see Oxley at any moment. After ten minutes, and requiring the key to the chaff house, he went to the door and called out, Aren't you going to get up today? Having called out three or four times trying to rouse someone, he returned to the yard. After ten minutes passed and Stanley began to grow concerned, he went to the back door and found it open. On entering he saw the body of Harry Walter, with his arms still crossed on his chest as he reposed. He then checked the bedroom and seeing the carnage he turned and ran, asking a man named Mac who lived across the road to get up and saying that something serious had happened. Then he ran to intercept a man named Link, who lived in Sturt Street, who was on his way down Hobson's place. Stanley asked him to look inside, and Link went in and viewed the bodies. One of the girls had her head raised at the time he went in. He complained later in a newspaper interview it was a sight he wished he had been spared, it being something he could never have imagined when he set out to buy some poultry for Christmas dinner. At least one other neighbour, a man named O'Connell, was invited to view the horror, presumably by Stanley, before he ran off to fetch the police, leaving a son of Mr Mack to guard the gate. Soon the police, as well as doctors Robertson and Mitchie, arrived. In the bedroom they found that both girls, despite their horrific injuries, were still alive. An ambulance quickly conveyed them to hospital, but within an hour of arrival both had died. The policeman entrusted with the task of escorting the dying children later said it was a most terrible experience. At the house nothing was out of place, indicating there had been no struggle. In the parlour which led off the dining room and into the shop, photos of relatives lined the mantelpiece, including a recent one of the girls with their long dark hair, along with an Easter card and a large clock. On a table in the room was the family Bible, along with prayer books and a score of children's picture books, some of them Christmas presents. Others were prizes from school. Harry Walter and Ethel were intelligent children and had been awarded a couple of the books. A certificate dated 4th of November 1892 awarded to Harry Walter for passing every class that year at Narracourt School lay next to a similar one earned by Ethel for her scholastic efforts. Plates of fruit from the evening before, principally cherries, remained. Cherry stones left to the side showing the family had partaken of them before bed. Two-thirds of a Christmas cake was found in a cupboard. Ashby, the last man to have spoken to Oxley, related afterwards that he had never met Oxley before Saturday morning, but in talking to him, though he found him somewhat excited, never dreamed he would commit a murder. A jury was summoned on Christmas Day and viewed the house, with the bodies of Harry, Emma and their son still laying where they died. Then the inquest was scheduled for the following day. Outside, curious onlookers came by to glimpse the corner shop with its Christmas decorations in the windows and bodies in the rooms. Lelias Day arrived from Goodwood to take the children out for a walk in the afternoon and was shocked to discover what had happened, having observed the affection the family held for one another all week. The inquest held on Tuesday heard from those who had known the Oxleys during their brief time in Adelaide. The jury declared that Oxley had acted during a fit of insanity Although he was comparatively wealthy, Oxley seemed to fear that he would be unable to provide for his family, and dreaded his circumstances and where they would lead. Somehow, in his disturbed thoughts, death presented as the most viable escape for himself and his loved ones. The funeral of all five victims of the tragedy took place at West Terrace Cemetery shortly after midday on the 27th of December. A large group of onlookers, mostly women, had gathered half at the morgue and half at the graveside, which was protected by police. A hearse arrived and the coffin containing the body of Harry Oxley was brought out and placed upon it and driven to the grave. Two mourning coaches with two sisters of Emma and others aboard followed. The crowd coalesced around the grave, causing a delay. 
The body of Emma Oxley was the next born to the graveside. A third journey delivered the bodies of Harry Walter and Ethel, and on the final journey the body of Grace was brought over. All of the coffins bore wreaths and floral tributes, the coffins containing the children being white. Harry and Emma were buried in one grave, and the children together in another beside their parents. Reverend Farr conducted the service, reading the 39th Psalm, which speaks of despair and hope. He made no mention of the terrible events of Christmas morning. The Standard was an Adelaide newspaper which was published between 1894 and 1896. Only two surviving issues are known to exist, but the Narra Court Herald described it as sensationalist. In March 1894, an old woman from Narra Court named Anne Lynch related a strange story which was published in the Standard. She claimed that her husband had been gotten drunk by Harry Oxley and another man, and convinced to sell his 552 acre farm at 12 shillings and sixpence an acre, when it was worth at least six pounds per acre. Her husband continued drinking and left for Melbourne. One night she dreamed she saw her husband beside a river. Another man lifted a bottle and brought it down again and again onto Lynch's bald head until blood rushed out. She wrote to police and identified a man found dead by the Yarra as her husband. Then she saw the illustrations of Oxley after he killed his family and recognised the man from her dream. She went on to claim Oxley had been paid to kill her husband because he could have provided information on land dumbing and perjury around Narracourt. The knowledge of what Oxley had done drove him insane and caused him to kill his family, she said. Apparently a man named Lynch was found dead in the Yarra, but there was no evidence Oxley was connected in any way. The Narracourt Herald labelled their story above the headline as a big joke. Anne Lynch had a reputation in Narracourt for incredible stories, lacking in verity. The Oxley tragedy remained the yardstick by which similar tragedies in South Australia were measured for many years to come.